chapter 5. Gospel according to Luke chapter 5. I want to look at that for a few minutes on today. And I want to briefly call your attention to verses 23 and 24. Again, the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. Gospel according to Luke chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 23 and 24 for just a few minutes here. And it says, Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. Now let's go and do 25 also. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Verse 24 again, he says, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. All right. So what I want to do for a few minutes is to uh, talk to you, if I could, from the subject, the spectators, the spectators, the spectators, the spectators. Whether you realize it or not, your life is full of spectators. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Your life is full of spectators. May not have even really thought about it much, but it is. It really is. Well, someone may ask, well, what is a spectator? What are you talking about? Well, a spectator is simply one who looks on. Simply one who watches. Uh, You know, uh, young people. Yep, there are spectators in your life. Whether you're at the school whether you're at the bus stop, riding on the bus, standing in the carpool line, or in the classroom, walking down the hallway, eating your lunch in the cafeteria, or playing extracurricular activity, our life is full of spectators. At some point in time, you have someone watching you, watching what you're doing, looking to see what you're doing. And that's ideal. You know, that, that's ideal that in life is that you will have Uh, spectators. And so that's just a part of everyday life. And so as we think about that, as we think about that, you know, uh, as we look at the story on today in Luke chapter 5, Jesus had spectators. He sure did, yeah. Jesus had spectators. So we have something in common with Jesus. He had spectators. And, and so uh, oftentimes he would have, a lot of times he would have those individuals looking at him, observing him, watching him. Absolutely. Again, that's just a part of everyday living, of, of everyday life. And so what I want to do on this morning is, is I want to look at those spectators who were watching him. And then I, I, I want to look at how did he respond? Uh, to those spectators, because you have to realize and understand that sometimes when spectators are watching you, uh, there may be some who have intentions or motives behind uh, why they're watching you. All right, so let's take a look at this here and see what we can find out on today. So in Luke, the Gospel of Luke, according the Gospel according to Luke, chapter five, what we have here, uh, right down here, right at verse seventeen. Where it says, and it came to pass there, it came to pass on a certain day. Okay, a certain day, a certain day, a typical day. We all have typical days. What is a typical day? A typical day simply represents a day in which you do what it is you normally do. I think it was last week, I believe it was, we talked a little bit about having a daily routine. Yeah, it was last week. We talked about having a daily routine. And last week we had examined uh, the fishermen and we looked at those things that went into their daily routine, how they got in the boat. All right. That was their transportation. If you remember that they got into the boat, they went out into the lake. The lake represented where their where the where the fish were. 
And then we talked about how well they had to have some type of equipment because they just couldn't reach down there with their hand, well, they, with the hand, but they had to have what? A fisherman's net. Fisherman's net. Okay, and then they had to have a routine as to how they prepped their nets and everything and how they went out about to see if they caught anything and then if they whatever they caught, so forth and so on, they processed it. Then they would wash their nets, stretch them, hang them up, let them dry so they could get ready for the next day. And so and so when you read the Bible and you look at the stories that are in here, uh, it talks about and deals with routines, routines. But now we, the interesting thing was that on last time is that Jesus was watching them. He was looking. He was looking to see what was happening, what was going on. And so and so for Jesus, sometimes he was the one watching to see what was going on. But then there were some times where he was the one being watched. OK. And so here, here in this particular in this particular instance, on a typical day, what we see here, it says, and it came to pass on a certain day as he was what? As he was teaching. Okay, as he was teaching. So what we see here is a typical day, just like it was a typical day for Simon Peter and, and the others to be out there in the boat fishing. Well, it was typical. It was a typical day, a normal day for Jesus to be out doing what? Teaching. And, you know, for the fishermen, that was their business. They were, they, they, that was their trade. And so for Jesus, you know, he, he was teaching. What was he doing? He was running his father's business. You know, in Luke chapter 2, verse 49, he said, you know, why are you worrying, why are you worrying about me? Do you not know but that I must be about my father's business? So Jesus understood his, his earthly assignment. He knew what, why he came. He knew what his, his purpose was. And so, and so ideal scenario, what we have here is simply an ideal scenario of what a typical day of ministry looked like for Jesus. You know, oftentimes when you think of ministry and you have to be careful in this day and time, people become so elevated and, and they become so uh, they become so lifted up and puffed up. We think that ministry, it's about, you know, telling the. The, the pastor, how wonderful, her, telling her how wonderful she is. And, oh, you're just so wonderful. Oh, you're just so marvelous. Oh, you're just so anointed. Ah, oh, the presence of the Lord is all over you. And we get so caught up in all that. There's only one who's wonderful, and that's Jesus. I know there was one instance in the Bible where the, where the man greeted Jesus and said, good master. And Jesus was responsive, why do you call me good? He says, not, there's not but one that's good. It, would it be possible, is it possible just to deflect the glory from you and give, it to whom, and give the glory to whom all glory is due? Uh, but, but we live in a day and time where ministry has become so, so, so puffed up. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But what we are looking at here, it was, it was an ideal scenario of what a typical day of ministry looked like for Jesus. And a typical day of ministry out in the marketplace for Jesus was not necessarily a day where everybody was patting him on the back. Oh, and, and telling him, oh, you did such a good job. Oh, you're such a wonderful teacher. Now, mind you, there were those who, who celebrated him because, because they appreciated his work. But, but what we have right here, though, in verse 17 of Luke chapter 5, really is, an, again, a typical day of ministry. And so it goes on and it says here, a certain day as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees. Now, now this is key right here. This is key right here. Because this is the first time Luke mentions the name Pharisees. So, so, so it is it's very important then by this being the first time that they are introduced in this particular interpretation of the gospel 
then we have to know a little bit about them. Have to know a little bit about them. Well, the Pharisees were, uh, they were a very dominant religious party during that time. Like today, you know, we have political parties. Political parties which have certain viewpoints about how they think government ought to function. Well, just as, you, as we have today certain political parties that have a certain uh, feel, have a certain perception as to how government ought to be, well, during that time in which Jesus lived, you had an influential religious party. And the role of that religious party was to basically share with the marketplace what they felt religion ought to be. See, all I'm doing is just painting the backdrop here. This was an ideal, typical day of ministry. So the Pharisees, they were a major religious party and, and widespread, a very widespread religious party because it said that, you know, they had maybe somewhere around 6,000 members and they were widespread in the region. You would find them in Galilee, Judea and Jerusalem. So they, so they had a vast presence in the, in, in the land. And, uh, and they were also teachers. Ah, they were teachers. So Jesus wasn't the only one teaching. <laughs> uh, yeah. See, an, an ideal, an ideal day, a typical day of uh, in ministry, you realize and understand that you may not, you're not the only one that has a ministry. There are other ministries out there in the marketplace. Absolutely. Jesus was not the only teacher in town. There were many other teachers in town. And some of those teachers belonged to the religious party that was called the what? The Pharisees. Now for the Pharisees and for the people in, in the marketplace, the Pharisees, they served as a religious example. So they, so they, so they were looked upon as the go-to party. If you had a question about the law of God, then you look to the Pharisees for the answers. All I'm doing, now, I'm just talking, I'm just talking, trying to tap into the environment, the climate, an ideal day of ministry for Jesus. Also about the Pharisees, the other thing that we understand is that they were self-appointed. They were self-appointed. Not only were they self-appointed, but they were seen as guardians of the law of God, the law of Moses. Now, a guardian is someone who does what? Guards, oversees. So they were seen as guardians of the law and its observance. So if there was any group of people who claimed to have expertise, knowledge, knowledge, and experience in the law of God, the Pharisees would be that group. So what was their train of thinking? What was their train of thought here? Because see, when, you, when, when you're dealing in ministry, oftentimes what you are dealing with is how people think. Uh, you're, not, you're not dealing with, with what people have. No, no, no. When, when you start dealing in ministry, you start dealing with how people think. Because when you start dealing with how people think, then you start dealing with how they think about what they have. Uh-oh, uh-oh. 
You start when you start dealing with how people think, you start dealing with how people think about how they manage their relationships, how they think about managing their money, how they think about managing their education, how they think managing their occupation. Because their they, their response that how they manage those areas in their life is reflected of what goes on on the inside. Because the outside is only a manifestation of what's going on on the inside. And so what, what was the thought process behind the school of the Pharisees? Well, here you go. This was their train of thought. There is an oral, oral, O-R-A. There is an oral law to complete and explain God's written law, if, as if God needed any help. There is an oral law to complete and explain God's written law. And so, and so, and so, and so for the Pharisees, they had this thing that was called, um, they had this thing called the Mishnah, M-I-S-H-N-A, Mishnah. Now, now, now what was the Mishnah? What was the Mishnah? The Mishnah. The Mishnah was simply... Uh, an accumulation of, of and, and I, I was as I was researching, in my research I found they called it, 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 the, the, it was an accumulation of steps and procedures, a long list of, of rules and regulations. And in the research, the researcher called them trifling, called them trifling. Because, because what it was, it was, a, it, was an, it was an accumulation of trifling steps and procedures of, uh, of things you had to do where it, it basically threw the law of God out the window. In other words, the effectiveness of God's law, it was almost like it became lost in this long, complicated list that was set up by the religious system. And they felt that in this thing called the Mishnah, this was how you were supposed to apply the law of God, the word of God, to your life. And if it didn't, and if it didn't coincide with what was in the Mishnah, then, then you, weren't, you were considered to be out of order. But the thing about it, it, it was so overbearing with steps and procedures from the, the washing of your hands and, and how you had to make sure that you washed the, 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 the pots and the plates. And, and it, it, it focused on outward steps and outward functioning, outward forms and outward observances, giving very little room to focus on the inward. Uh, giving very little room to focus on the inward because you were so concentrated and so and so and so focused on making sure that the outward look good. Uh, that's false representation right there because see the, the, the outward can look astounding but then on the inside it can be a hot mess. Oh it's so, it's so, it's so in life. You can you can present you can you can go and you can put you can put on the biggest smile outwardly to make people think that everything is 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 is, is running smoothly, but on the inside you are a nervous wreck. You want you one step away from having a nervous breakdown. So outward appearance. Outward appearance was, 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 was the order of the day. With the Pharisees, with the Pharisees, with the Pharisees, they were considered to be, not all of them, but the majority of them, were considered to be proud, arrogant, and self-righteous. Oh, it's true, it's so, it's so. 
Ah, in Matthew 23, you don't have to turn there, but you can jot it down and turn there later on. In Matthew 23, Jesus took it to him. <laughs> he took it to him. He called him out. Because, because Jesus understood. See, that's another thing. That's another thing. That's another thing. You have to be readily of, you have to be, you have to be, you have to know who you're dealing with out in the marketplace. Jesus knew, you know, they were proud and they were self-righteous. He knew, he knew that they loved, they, because see, the, the, the fact, they loved to attract the attention of the people. Oh, yes, they did. He talks about it in Matthew 23. He talks about them in Matthew 23. He says they love to come into the room and have all eyes on them. They love it. They love it. They love it. Oh, they love to come into the room and all eyes are fixated on them. They love to come into the room and people, oh, oh, you look so wonderful. Oh, you look so marvelous. Oh, I just love how you, oh, I just love you. I just love you. I just, I just love you. I just, oh, they love it. They love it. They love it when people kiss up to them. The Pharisees, they were a group of people that they, 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 they loved to excite the admiration of the crowd. Oh, they, 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 they lived for it. They, they bathed in it. That's the kind of spectators Ah, because in our story on today, the, the Pharisees are serving as the who? The spectators, the ones who are looking and doing what? Watching. All I'm talking about is a typical ideal day of ministry for Jesus. <laughs> And you have to, and you have to get this. And you, and you have to understand this. See, because because because, because, because if, if, if you if in the crowd there are a group of spectators who you know that they are proud and self righteous and they love the attention of the audience, then you almost have to understand and realize that they don't want nobody else. Oh, come. they don't want nobody else to steal away. Their attention. Why? Because that's what defines them. And when you come and steal away what they think rightfully belongs to them, oh, then you are walking on dangerous ground. <laughs> ah, so Jesus knew exactly. Who he was, and you have to realize and understand that, that that in this hour, when you talk about doing ministry, when you talk about do, when you talk about uh, facilitating ministry, what you realize and understand that there are other people watching how you do what it is that you do. And they are watching to see not so much what they can learn from you, but rather what they what they what can they take from you to help add to them. But if anything, they want to make sure that that, 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 that you don't take away. Oh Lord, have mercy! Listen, there is enough sin to go around. Oh, it's so oh, yeah, it is it. There is enough unrighteousness to go around. Listen, whoever I don't reach, hopefully you can reach. But don't be threatened by somebody else's ministry thinking that they come to take away. Lord have mercy. Jesus. So watch this here, watch this here. Spectators, spectators. Let's keep going. So what I've given you here is just simply... A definition of who these Pharisees are. We get, you got that? And so, and so the thing that you understand about the Pharisees is that they were concerned about outward. That's the key. You understand they were concerned about outward. So now let's, let's see here. It says, as he was teaching, verse 17, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law doing what? Sitting. That's what spectators do. They sit. 
And they what? And they watch. They sit and they watch. And, and it says, which were come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And I said that a few minutes ago. But now, watch it. That, now, that's not all that was present on that day. That's not, all that was, that's not all that was present on that day because there's something else that was present in the atmosphere as well. Look at the end of verse 17. It says, and the what? And the power of the Lord was what? Present also. So an ideal day of what typical ministry looked like for Jesus. He had spectators. You know, he was, he was out there teaching. He had spectators, but then also the presence of the Lord, the power of the Lord was what? Was there. Now, what is it about this power? What is it about this power? What is it about this power? Well, the power of the Lord, it was like what is called a commodity. Now, what is a commodity? Well, a commodity is just simply something useful or valuable, something that, that can help someone else. Huh? Something that can help someone else. And so then when you talk about the power of the Lord was present. Now look what it says there. It says, and the power of the Lord was present. It wasn't just there just to be there, was it? No. But the power of the Lord was present to do what? To make a difference. To heal the one that was sick. Now see that? Now you have a lot right there in verse 17, don't you? That's a typical day. That was a typical day of ministry for, for Jesus. You had the power of the Lord working in the room. You had, you know, Jesus, he was teaching, he was healing. But then not only that, but you had the who? The spectators right there in the room as well. Watching to see what was going to happen. What was going on. I'm just talking. We're just talking. We're just looking at this here. We're just looking at it here on today. So now, so now, so now, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Now, here's the thing you understand about Jesus' style of teaching. Jesus' style of teaching. Now, Jesus' style of teaching was that Jesus taught that true relationship with the Lord True relationship with God. It was not about the outward. It's not about a lot of forms, a lot of observances, a lot of steps, and a lot of procedures. It wasn't about that. True relationship with God came from what was on the what? Inside. Inside. True relationship with God came from the inside. Inward spiritual growth was key. But now, but now, but now, what Jesus specialized in, and he emphasizes, humility. Humility. Lowliness of spirit. Being humble was key. So, so see, Jesus, when he came on, on, onto the scene, he came onto the scene with a totally different angle. The Pharisees, they were, they were more close, they were concerned with what? Outward. Jesus was concerned with what? The inward. That's the difference. That's the difference. And so, and so an ideal day for Jesus, you know, when he talked, when Jesus was concerned about the inward, he always had his spectators there watching him because they were always concerned about the outward. How Jesus did what he did. Did he follow the right? Did he follow this instruction? Did he follow that instruction? And if he didn't follow it the way they thought he needed to follow it, then he was in the wrong. That was that was how tip, that was typical ministry. That's, I mean, that's how that's how that, that's how it went down for him, for Jesus. All right. So so then spectators, they focus on the outward. Jesus focused on the on the inward. OK. Now. Let's see here. So the question, the challenge becomes for Jesus is, well, how do you maintain, how do you maintain who you are in ministry, Jesus, even though you know that you're in your audience, there are those who are watching you, but also there are those in the audience that are against what, you, what you're teaching. They are, they are against what you're teaching. What do you do? How do you handle it? Well, let's take a look here. Let's take a look here. 
All right. So let's continue in the story. Verse 18. Let's, verse 18. And behold, men brought in a bed, a man which was taken with palsy. He was paralyzed. All right. It says, and they, and they were looking for a means to bring him in, bring the man in, and lay him before Jesus. They were trying to figure out how they could bring in this man who was paralyzed. How could they bring him in and get, how could they get him, get him to Jesus? Now, here's the, here was the problem. It was so crowded there. That because it says there in verse 19, they could not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd of the people that was in there. So what they ended up doing, they had to go up on top of the house. And they went up on top of the house and they came up with a way that they could, they could uh, let the man, they could remove some of the tiles off the, off the roof and they could let the man down through the roof. All right. They, these people, they were determined to get this man down to where Jesus was. All right. And so and so now, you know, while Jesus, now Jesus is still teaching. You know, he's still he's still trying to, to, to do ministry. And now his spectators are there, too. Now, watch it. Room is full of people. Spectators are watching. Jesus is teaching. You got men taking off the roof. Trying to bring Lord this man's bed down so that the man can get in the presence of the Lord. Now watch this. Watch this. Verse twenty. You have a lot going on in this. In this. In this. In this. Uh, right here now. But Jesus saw him. Jesus saw him. He says he saw their what? It says he. And when Jesus saw their faith. Faith enough to believe that if we can get this man down here to where Jesus is, something good, something positive can happen. Something good can happen. Something positive can happen. Now, understand this. Understand this now. Understand this. You had all these spectators watching, observing to see what was going to happen. So now look at what happened. Look at what happened. Jesus did what? Said unto the man, said unto him, man, thy sins are what? Forgiven. Forgiven thee. That's all he said. That's all Jesus said. Man, thy sins be. So, they, so once they lowered the man who was paralyzed, once they got him down to where Jesus was, Jesus said to him, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Now, verse 21, verse 21. It said, now look at this here. Why did Jesus say that? Oh, boy. He opened a can of worms right there. It says, and the scribes and the Pharisees, his spectators, began to do what? Question. They began to reason amongst themselves, within themselves. Now, look at what they said. Look at what they said. Who is this? Which does what? Speaketh blasphemies. Now, that's key right there. That's key right there. Why is that key? Because watch this. Sometimes your spectators, just like here with Jesus, sometimes your spectators come to do two things. They come to question who you are, and they come to question the quality of the work that you're doing. Because that's what they did right there in verse 21. They questioned who Jesus was. They said, who is this? Who is this? And then they question the quality of what he told the man. Because all Jesus told the man was what? Man, thy sins be forgiven thee. But see, his spectators, the Pharisees, thought there was something wrong with what Jesus said. Uh, be careful because spectators, they will oftentimes come to try and find fault in what it is you're doing. Who is this? which speaketh blasphemy. Who can, because now watch this, in their mindset, they say, well, here it's, it, it says, who can forgive sins but God alone? So in their thinking, in their mindset, Jesus did not have the authority to forgive sins. But see, that lets you know, they did not believe in who Jesus was. Huh? They didn't believe in who Jesus was. They didn't. They didn't. And see, and see verse 22 says, but Jesus knew their thoughts. 
And he answered them. He said, why do you reason in your hearts? Why do you reason in your hearts? They came to challenge who he was and to challenge his quality of work. Why reason in your hearts? Now, here's the thing you, now, here's the thing you need to see here. Here's the thing you need to see. Now, for Jesus, he understood that he only did what he was supposed to do. He only did as his father told him to do. You know, over in John 8, 28, he says, I do nothing of myself. He says, but as my father have taught me, those are the things that I speak. So what we understand about Jesus is that he only did that which his father told him to do. So now, watch this, watch this. Verse 23, verse 23 now. Whether it is easier, Jesus says, whether it is easier to do what? To say. Now, I just said it. Jesus is only going to say that which his father tells him. That, that was how he rolled. That's how he functioned. John eight twenty eight says it. So if we understand then that Jesus was the type of person who did what he was instructed to do, then his father knew at that particular instance what needed to be said. <laughs> Jesus, God knew exactly what needed to be said in that moment, y'all. That's why the, the Lord, he knows exactly what is needed. And sometimes when he gives you an assignment, he knows that your assignment is needed by someone in, in this very hour. But now look at what it says. Look at what Jesus says. He says, whether it is easier to say, number one, thy sins be forgiven thee. That's the first option. Or number two, say what? Rise up and walk. He's got two options in his belt he can use. Two options he can use. Two options he's working with here. And all he has to do is say one or the other. But he has to be sensitive to the environment and sensitive enough to know which way do you want me to go. Jesus had to be sensitive to his father to know, okay, because I can do, I can say either one and still get the same result. <laughs> that the man's going to get out of here and go about his business and be better off than he came. But it's just a matter of which one. Do, see, see, in ministry, you got to have different options available. You got to have, di have different initiatives available. And know, and know that, 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 that when the time comes, the Lord will tell you which initiative is needed at that moment. That, that, that's all it is. That's all it is. This is that's all this in here is. Jesus said, whether it is easier to say option number one, thy sins be forgiven, or option number two, say rise up and walk. Jesus had some options available. In ministry, you got to have different initiatives available to meet different needs. You got to have something to work. That's your equipment. Lord have mercy. That's your equipment. Fishermen had what? Nets to work with. Yeah. Jesus, all he had was, all he had to do was what? Speak it. Fishermen have nets. Jesus had the spoken word. What? What kind of initiative do you have? What kind of spoken word do you have in your mouth that can help someone else in this hour? Jesus said, which is easier? Because there's nothing for me to open my mouth. And when I open my mouth, things begin to happen. Which is easier? Neither one is difficult for me. All I have to do what? Is, is, is speak that which my father tells me to speak at the time that is appropriate. Whether it's easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee or to say rise up and walk. Verse 24. 
but that who ye may know. In other words, this what yeah, this wasn't so much about the man, the paralyzed man, but this one was about who the spectators are watching. This was about addressing the narrow mindedness of the Pharisees. He says, but that ye may know that the Son of Man has power upon earth to forgive sins. God wanted you to know, Pharisees, today, that I had that He has up yeah, that He has given. Me, the power, the power has been given to Jesus upon earth to do what? To forgive sins. That's why he said unto, that's why he said what he said back up there in verse number 20. Right there, you know, you know right there in verse 24, that was enough to make those men in that room so enough angry. Sure not angry. But Jesus did what he was supposed to do. My final point is this. Regardless of what your spectators come to do, do as you are told. I'm going to, regardless of what the spectators come to do, you do as the Lord has told you. Because there's someone out there that needs to hear what it is you have to say. There is someone out there that needs to receive what it is you have to offer. So he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, arise, take up thy couch and do what? And go in to thine house. And immediately the man rose up before them took up that which he was laying on and departed to his own house doing what? Glorifying God. And everyone was amazed in the room at what had just taken place. Spectators, spectators, spectators. Spectators come to question who you are and they come to challenge the quality of your work. But regardless of what the spectators come to do, do as you have been told to do and as you have been instructed that's what it's about in this that's an ideal typical day scenario for Jesus because <laughs> when he went wherever he went to whenever he went at the end of the day to lie down I'm sure he was able to lie down knowing that he had done what it was he had been called and told to do but he also understood that he made some people mad absolutely he made some people mad. But that's all right, though. As long as you do what it is you've been told to do, then you'll, just, you'll, you'll be just fine. Because the danger is that you go and you lay down and you didn't do what God told you to do. You don't want to have God. You would much rather have people upset with you than rather have God upset with you because you didn't do what it was he told you to do. But Jesus is a prime example of what everyday ministry is about. Regardless of what the spectators come to do, you do as you are told to do. Because there's somebody out there that needs what it is you have to offer. Listen, if there's someone on today and you don't know who Jesus is as your Lord and personal Savior, today is a good day for you to give your life to him. I don't care what kind of lifestyle you may be currently engaged in. I don't care what things are going on in your life. I encourage you on today to give your life to the Lord Jesus. Why? He died for you. He died that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But you have to have you have to receive him as Lord and Savior. It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. This is about you and your life. Yeah. There's no need for you to die and spend eternity in hell when there's an opportunity for you to spend eternity in heaven with the Lord. But you have to be willing to accept him as, as, as Lord and Savior. If that's you on today, you say, you know what? I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner, but I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you were buried and I believe that God raised you from the dead. 
and that you live now and forevermore. I ask you to come into my life right now as my Lord and Savior. I thank you for the gift of life, Lord. I thank you for it right now. And I willingly embrace you as my Lord and Savior. I thank you, I praise you, and I glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, listen, if you accepted, if you prayed that prayer with me and you were sincere now, and you, I believe with you that you have given your life to the Lord, go to our website, takeitbyforce.net, email us, go down to the bottom, contact us, email us, let us know that you've given your life to the Lord Jesus, and we want to follow up with you. We've got a, 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 a small pamphlet we want to get out to you. We want to send it to you. It's called A Guidebook for New Christians. Now what? We want to get that into your hands and follow up with you. It's a good day for you, and we celebrate your decision to give your life to the Lord. Well, we're getting ready to close out in prayer. Father, we thank you right now for this opportunity to study your word. I pray that something was said to motivate and to encourage the listener. Lord, for those who are going to hear this message later on down the week, Lord, let it resonate within them. Let it bring forth power. Let it bring forth uh, liberty right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for the households that are going to be watching this on this week, Lord, and, and in the future. We pray for those leaders in those homes, Lord, that you will give them a godly mindset, Lord, to, 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 to lead their home in the path of righteousness. Father, we pray for, for leadership in our school, in our school systems. Lord, put people in place that have a godly desire to, to, to promote righteousness and uprightness in the school system, Lord. We pray for, for, gov for governmental officials in the government, on the state. On the local, state, national, and global level, we need godly leaders now more than ever. Father, we thank you right now for this opportunity. We don't take it for granted. Ah, but we serve notice that the devil, he's defeated in every area. And we continue to proclaim your word, even when the eyes of the spectators, when the spectators of this world are watching us. Lord, we stand bold in your word.